In this first lecture, we want to give you the adequate divisions of divine names. This serves as the grid work, or even the map, of everything that we'll build off of in subsequent lectures. And in fact, it's an extremely important foundational lecture whose basic elements will just continue to expand more and more as we go along. So on the one hand, don't worry if you don't understand everything at once. But on the other, do try and get the main gestures and categories which will refine and further down the line. All right, beginning then with some initial remarks. Although it's not always considered today, adequacy used to be among the goals of theology. And adequacy is the general notion behind the divisions or, if you like, categories of divine names. This is very different from today, where we hardly ever have any notion of adequacy in theology. Classically, however, adequacy was one of the sin qua nons of doing good theology. This particularly is true in scholastic theology, where, especially in high medievals, we find that theologians begin to conclude their treatises by reflecting on their adequacy. What more is to be asked? asked uh, said Anselm, and these sayings suffice, concluded Thomas. During this time, then, theology was being made universally adequate, and in fact, Thomas had a lot to do with it. Indeed, among the many triumphs of Thomas was that he made theology universal and adequate. Universal in that his theology involved everything which can be said of God, and adequate in that his theology handled all of this reductively with everything enclosed and nothing missed. In this, Thomas made theology comparative to Aristotle's philosophy. His divine names were therefore similar to Aristotle's 10 categories, because just as Aristotle's categories adequately divide created being, just so Thomas's divine names adequately divided divine ends or all divine truths. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why Thomas's theology is so difficult at first to get a hold of, because it's super condensed. We've boiled the entire created universe down to its most basic salt crystals, and we're saying each and all of those crystals, as it were, of God. So universality and adequacy, that's the goal. And in a certain mode, accomplishing this goal uh, was not something that was entirely unique to Thomas, nor was its actual accomplishment his alone. In fact, Thomas, like every bachelor commenting on the Lombard sentences, handled this issue as a routine in I sent D22, which you will want to consult for further uh, information. As well, Thomas's eventual triumph was helped by earlier medievals such as Anselm, with his division of divine names into those taken from simple versus those taken from mixed perfections. We'll talk about those a little bit more later. And of course, Thomas was also helped by philosophers such as Aristotle, for whom universality and adequacy were always intended in philosophy. If you know anything about Aristotle, you know that that's what he's about. Nonetheless, Thomas's divisions of divine names have particular reasons for their universality and adequacy, which make it most likely that the fact that his theology is perhaps the best theology proper to have been, and also quite possibly the final theology proper to ever be. What were Thomas's divisions of divine names then, or his adequate categories? That'll be the issue in focus throughout this lecture. Well, let me first give them to you here in a nutshell, and then we'll circle back and consider each of these one by one. You'll become familiar with these divisions and be able to say them repeatedly and on cue as we go along. In fact, it'll just become second nature to you. But you'll want to write these down initially, also with the concrete examples we use, which are 
the code that we use to signal what category we're talking about. And again, you'll become much more uh, comfortable and familiar because I'll be repeating it a lot. All right, here it is. Divine names are divided into two, negative and positive. Negative names are also divided into two, prior, such as incorporeal, impassable, and so on, and posterior, simple, infinite, etc. Positive, or also called affirmative names, are likewise divided into two, absolute and relative. Absolute names are divided into two, although we'll expand and adjust this later, those designating simple perfections on the one hand and those designating mixed perfections on the other. And finally, relative names are likewise divided into two. We have creator, Lord, and others of that sort on the one hand, the rational divine names. And on the other, we have the Trinitarian real relations, paternity, filiation, and so on. Let me give you those one more time so you can write them down. And I also accidentally missed the examples for the absolute name. So I'll give those to you as well. Divine names are divided into two, positive and negative. Negative names into two, prior, incorporeal, impassable, and so on. And posterior negative names, simple, infinite, and the like. Positive, also called affirmative names, are likewise divided into two, absolute and relative. Absolute divine names are divided into two. Those designating simple perfections, here's the examples, wise, good, and so on. And those designating mixed perfections, reasons, laughs, etc. Wise, good, reasons, laughs, and so on. Relative names, on the other hand, likewise divided into two. Those that are rational, creator, lord, and so on. And those whose truth, as we'll discover, involve real being rather than merely rational. These are the Trinitarian relations, father, son, and so on. These two divisions of relative names, just uh, for a brief remark here, involve relations, as I've mentioned, which are often called rational and real relations, respectively. Although many people become confused about this and imagine that rational relations have no foundation in reality. These are philosophical matters that I'm flagging here. We'll consider at the end of this lecture very briefly, but then we'll deal with these matters much more extensively later on. All right, this summary of the divisions in mind, let's circle back and consider this further one by one. From Thomas's perspective, nothing of God is known except from creatures whence divine names are usurped and predicated of God. This is a fundamental principle of Thomist theology. Nothing of God is known except from creatures whence we take names into Duenas and predicate them of God. Furthermore, every good theologian refuses to say anything in Duenas until he's determined the predicate whose formality is realized with us and among creatures. This is also another fundamental principle of Thomas theology. Indeed, creatures control divine naming as the principle or source of divine names. Creatures are our control. Creatures even control our divisions of divine names because when we consider all creaturely predicates which can be said of God, we find various kinds. These various kinds make divisions in divine names. That's the point. This brings us then to the first division. All divine names are divided into two, negative and positive. Where do we get this division from? Well, as we consider the creaturely order, we find that there are two different kinds of real aspects or rationes, as Thomas would say. Those of potency, potency, 
and act, just as Aristotle defined them. These two aspects globally range over all creatures and are their most fundamental and also adequate reduction. This is why we say in the 24 Thomistic Theses, Thesis 1, that being, particularly created, is divided into potency and act. Every creature is nothing else except a certain composition of potency and act. This fundamental real distinction of potency and act in creatures makes our first division in divine naming between negative and positive divine names. Potency and act in creatures, negative and positive divine names in theology. Negative names are those whose predicates are potencies or imperfections, because potency needs to be divided or removed from God by negative judgment. Positive names, on the other hand, are those which are predicated of God, whose predicates are acts or perfections, because act is to be composed or retained of God in affirmative judgment. Again, potency and act in creatures, negative and positive names in theology. Fundamentally, in theology, from Thomas's perspective, Whenever we find imperfection with us and among creatures, we say that it's not similar to God or that God doesn't have it. Whereas, whenever we find perfection with us and among creatures, we say that this is similar to God and that God somehow has it. Indeed, this constitutes the fundamental task of theology. Retain everything of act and perfection with us and among creatures of God, having removed everything of potency and imperfection and found the ever greater dissimilitude. This is something you'll hear me say constantly because it's fundamental to Thomas theology. Remove and retain. Remove imperfection, retain perfection. Or more fulsomely, retain everything of act and perfection with us and among creatures of God after you've removed everything of potency and imperfection and also found the ever greater dissimilitude. A couple of brief remarks about each of these, negative and positive names. And again, don't worry. We'll be covering each of these in several lectures to come. We're just concerned here to get the basics down. We're going to spend, for example, like four or five lectures on negative names, something like that. I've just got a couple paragraphs to cover here. Some brief comments then. Negative names, first of all. Negative names are those which are said through division or negative judgment, i.e. is not. That's what division or negative judgment, it goes by various philosophical names, actually is. Making an is not or removing, dividing, severing in your intellect. These names remove or private something real in creatures, i.e. their potencies, from God. In a similar way, as I can say that Socrates is not a dog or that he doesn't have redness, just so I can also say that God is not an accident or that he's not material. Importantly. Note that negative names don't posit something, but merely remove something. They don't signify God in any mode, Thomas says, ST1, Q13, A2, Respondo. Don't signify him in any mode. I've known nothing of what Socrates is as a man by saying that he's not a dog. Similarly, when I say that God is simple, impassable, and so on, I have known nothing of what he is, only that he somehow makes true these divisions in my intellect, and that the reason he makes them true is because he is greater or more perfect than something which is composite, passable, and so on. 
Negative or privative names, in other words, make God transcendent and distinguish him from creatures. And indeed, the larger and larger bundle of privations we use, the more and more distinctly do we somehow know him, Thomas says in SCG 1 C14, pulling, in fact, from Maimonides. In this sense, negative names have the final cause, we could say, of sanctifying or making God holy. And this is sometimes why they are called his properties or distinctive slash unique truths, considering properties or propria the way Aristotle does in his topics. Giving these distinctive features of God is one of the most basic tasks in theology. God is not this, not that, but wholly other. As we negate, we have more knowledge of God as the one who always is ever greater. And negative theology in these senses is best and most fundamental, saying rather what God is not than what he is. Nonetheless, we do say what God is, not immediately, but analogically, knowing God just as a cause is known in its effects. You need to write that down. It's super important. We do say what God is, not immediately, but analogically, knowing God just as a cause is known in its effects. This is something Thomas says all over the place. We do this in positive names, the first of which is merely that God is or that he has being as the cause of that being or essay in creatures. Positive or sometimes called affirmative names, you'll hear me refer to either one, are those then which somehow affirm something in Duenas through a composition or act of intellectual affirmation, i.e. an is statement, an is action of the mind, composing, uniting, joining a predicate to subject, just like we say Socrates is wise. Importantly, note that affirmative names merely say something of God, not as himself, but only as cause of creatures, not as himself, just as cause of creatures. However, certain affirmative names do indeed give us positive knowledge of God, as it were, as himself, before and behind he is cause of creatures. Right? There are certain affirmative names that it's quasi-knowledge of God as he is in himself. These latter affirmative names are what people today would call the divine attributes or divine perfections. Normal person talk, that's what they mean. They're names such as wise, good, and so on. In fact, wise and good are always the two examples we use. Um, those are the ones I always use because those are the ones Thomas always uses, and Thomas has uh, a large number of reasons for doing so, some of which we'll talk about at another point. It happens that many kinds of predicates can be affirmed of God, but only some are divine attributes, so to speak. Only some actually posit something in God which so is real that the predicate we're affirming is similar to something real in God. For example, when we say that God is wise, this posits wisdom in God. and. God so verifies this predicate that this wisdom with us and among creatures indeed is similar to something real in God, which we can speak of as God's own wisdom. These kinds of affirmative names in this sense will be the most important ones, actually saying what God is, although no eyes in the mode proper to or unique to God. Even the very first affirmative name, and the one most unique to God, i.e. that God is or has being, must be chastened, must become holy, because, 
the being or essay in creatures is accidental or contingent, if you like, whereas in God, it more is substantial, as Thomas says in, for example, De Potentia Q1 A1 Respondeo. So much is this chastening needed that Thomas will often say that never do we actually say what God is. In other words, we never say what God is in that exact sense that we say that Socrates is wise, having definitional or comprehensive knowledge. Although we do say what God is, so to speak, in that via some affirmed predicates, we can have analogical and partial knowledge because every effect somehow makes moan not merely that its cause is, but even somewhat what its cause is. This is the scholastic principle, omne agens agat sibi simile. Every uh, agent so acts that it's the efficiently caused effect has a similarity to that agent himself. This in mind, and again, we'll expand these matters in lectures to come. Um, this in mind, though, we come now to our second division, our second division of divine names. We've divided into negative and positive, and now we divide negative names themselves into two, making for two species under the genus of negative names. We call these two types, and heuristically, prior and posterior negative names, prior and posterior. And don't get too hung up about these terms prior and posterior. We'll talk about why we call them that in a moment. Sometimes people get a little bit hung up here. Um, these are heuristic distinctions, particularly under these negations that I'll explain why in a moment. This second division of negative names into two is based upon two different kinds of potencies with us and among creatures. Again, creatures control our divine names. Those two different kinds of potencies are potencies in the material order only versus potencies in both material and immaterial orders. Potency in the material order versus potency in both material and immaterial orders. Prior negative names are those which we use to remove or private from God the real potencies had by material creatures as material. For example, incorporeal, impassable, and so on. Whereas posterior negative names we use to divide from God the real potencies had by both material and immaterial, immaterial creatures. In other words, those potencies had by creatures as such, as creatures. These are negative names like simple, infinite, and so on. These are, again, two classes addressing two universal creaturely conditions, one merely material, and then the other, universally speaking, just creatures across the board, whether we're talking about embodied or angelic, broad, broadly speaking. Once again, a word on each of these. Prior negative names, such as incorporeal, impassable, and so on, are negative names which we're concerned with, first of all, or priorly, that's why I, we call them priorly, we're concerned with them, first of all, in the order of learning or coming to know divine truths. If you're a learner here, which we all are, these are the names you hit, first of all. And when you're teaching, these are the names you cover a lot in contrast to operating in the order of understanding or, or um, having divine truths uh, from the other direction, as a master would. These negations are removing from God, we might say, the larger potencies or the greater imperfections in creatures. Because of this, these negative names are primarily and most explicitly taught in Holy Scripture, which doesn't really teach us of the posterior negative names, such as God is simple, infinite, and so on. The reason is that the posterior or 
later in the order of knowing or learning, a posterior negative names handle potencies which are beyond the material order as such, and therefore are handling things which are not sensible and so harder to know. These are the things that you have to have metaphysics or philosophy to understand. When we teach theology then, Similarly, we're concerned to make people know that God is not like material realities around us, and so we begin distinguishing God therefrom. This is similar to beginning with the demonstration that God is from motion, which, of course, Thomas does famously, a motion which is maximally sensible and therefore easiest to understand and feels closest to home because it, in fact, is closest to home. Similarly, the more sensible potencies are to be removed, first of all, as we teach people and begin to induct them into divine knowledge. Thomas, for example, even begins with not actual potencies, which are already philosophical concepts, but rather begins with concrete material realities such as accidents in contrast to substance in order to distinguish God from concrete beings or realities from around us, SCG 1, C14. Holy Scripture also does this, distinguishing God from the gods, from men, from material realities, because all of these are maximally sensible and therefore most easy to err about, most powerful to know God with reference to, and so on and so forth. Because Holy Scripture is given to the common man, this is why we find these kinds of names in Holy Scripture. Whereas names like simple, infinite, and even eternal, according to how scholastics teach it, we just don't find in Holy Scripture. Whereas posterior negative names, on the other hand, such as simple, infinite, and so on, are the negative names which we are concerned with secondly, or again, last of all, here again, speaking in the order of learning. These are much more difficult because their predicates are not sensible. And indeed, we have to take considerable time to prepare these predicates philosophically before we even begin usurping them into Duenas. When I say that God is incorporeal, it's very easy for you to latch on to the truth in this negative judgment because, generally speaking, you know intuitively what it is to have a body. But when I use other negations that are falling into this prior or posterior negative name category, such as simplicity, then it's much more difficult for you to understand. Simplicity handles real composition in creatures, which is a metaphysical concept particularly a real composition or real distinction between essay and dissentia, being in essence, which is involved with the root potency of creatures as such. This is something we do as Thomists in philosophy and metaphysics, certainly not on day one, but nonetheless, we do it there. Preparing this predicate takes considerable time, and only when the creaturely truth of the real distinction is understood in our minds can we actually begin to negate it of God and do so with any real impact and self-possession? It does no good to learn of God, to more distinguish God, when you don't know clearly what he's being distinguished from. If I told you that Socrates is not a dog, and you didn't intuitively know what a dog was, then this negative judgment is meaningless to you. Similarly, when I say that God is simple, if you don't intuitively know what the real distinction of essay and essentia is, then this true privation, which we do in scholastic theology, is meaningless to you, even though the true privation is most important in professional theology because simplicity handles the root potency or the fundamental condition of creatures as such. Creatures who fundamentally have being not from themselves, but from another, namely God. In this sense, simplicity is the first divine name, although once again, it doesn't say something of God, but merely removes composition from him. 
This is why Thomas puts it immediately after that God is, also because simplicity has programmatic importance for theology as a science. However, simplicity is not something we teach people straight off because of its philosophical difficulties and the risk of misunderstanding. One more general remark here about negative names broadly. You've probably flagged the fact that oftentimes negative names are said paraphrastically in a positive mode. Paraphrastically in a positive mode. God is simple, is paraphrastic for that he's not composite, particularly not composed of essay and essentia. Again, this is a real distinction with us and among creatures. God is infinite is also paraphrastic for that he's not finite, particularly not finited, for example, as form by matter or as act by potency. This paraphrasis confuses many people, particularly because they imagine from these paraphrastic affirmations that something's being known about God rather than nothing is being known about him except what he's not. Once again, as Thomas says in ST1Q13A2 Respondeo, negative names signify or communicate nothing of God, and no positivity can be squeezed out from them. In this sense, negative names, both prior and posterior, are no wise adjectives describing God, we might say but rather are adverbs commanding us of what must be done in our intellect in order to have truths about God, particularly when we handle actually positive names. This brings us, in fact, to that division, our third division of positive names into two. Positive names into two. We have divine names divide first of all, into two negative and positive, negative into two prior and posterior. Here are positive names, which happen through composition or affirmative judgment, also into two. Absolute versus relative positive names. This is our third division, and it's based upon whether the predicate makes something in the subject itself or only toward another than the subject. It's based upon whether the predicate makes something in the subject itself, or merely towards another than the subject. For example, saying that Socrates is wise posits wisdom in Socrates. It's an absolute divine name, or not divine name, absolute name which characterizes Socrates. Absolute, i.e., because it is in relation to the subject Socrates himself as distinguished from all others. Whereas saying that Socrates is the teacher of Plato doesn't posit something in Socrates, but rather considers Socrates the subject merely towards another, namely Plato. Note that, broadly speaking, this division corresponds, then, to the two kinds of Aristotelian accidental categories, absolute accidents, quantity, quality, and so on, versus the one relative accident whose proper concept is towards another and whose formality is a certain towardsness, as Cajetanus helpfully says. Indeed, because relative names such as creator, lord, and so on merely make God towards another, they're similar to negative or privative names in that they don't signify what God is. Neither negative nor relative names make us know what God is. Negative and relative names, Thomas says in ST1Q13A2 Respondeo, quote, signify his substance in no mode, but either signify the removing of something from him, as happens in negative names, or as happens in relative names, they signify a relation of him to another, or rather of another to him, Thomas says. We'll consider relative names further a bit below, but 
Let's move now to our fourth division of absolute names. The fourth division then, absolute positive names, you guessed it, into two. These absolute positive names would divide into two, those whose predicate no wise is removed, such as wise, good, and so on, and those whose predicate somehow is removed, somehow is removed, no wise removed, wise, good, and so on, and those whose predicate somehow is removed. This latter will actually further subdivide. Those whose predicate is only partially removed, for example, God laughs, God reasons, and so on, and those whose predicate is totally removed, God is a rock, God is a lion, etc. We can broadly say then that we have three classes of absolute positive names. Those that have no negation of the predicate, those that have some or partial negation of the predicate, and those that have all or total negation of the predicate. We'll significantly complicate this further much later, but here for our introductory purposes, it's sufficient. Before continuing, however, we're facing some more difficult matters. Recall that above, we saw that the very first fundamental division into negative or positive theology was made because of the fundamental real distinction of potency and act with us and among creatures. Real potencies, or creaturely reality insofar as it verifies the concept of potency, is to be removed or privated from God as not similar to him because potency is not similar to essay or being, which is the first effect of and therefore most similar to God. Whereas real acts or creaturely reality in as much as it verifies the concept of act is to be retained of God as similar to him. Firstly, the act of all acts, namely essay or being, which as Thomas says, is the proper or unique effect of God. Thomas is quoting from the book of causes, proposition four. And secondly, everything else, insofar as it has the concept of pure act and therefore is similar to essay or to being. These latter accidental formalities we have a special name for, we call them simple perfections. And we just mentioned them, wisdom, goodness, and so on. These are creaturely accidental forms that involve nothing else except act and perfection in their proper concept or essence. When we usurp them into duenas, we consider these as predicates, nothing internal to the predicate is of potency and imperfection. It's just pure actuality, so to speak. The point here is to recognize that creaturely reality is controlling our divine names, also controlling our divisions of divine names. Potency and act make negative and positive naming, and similarly, for the divisions of absolute positive names, various kinds of creaturely acts make various kinds of absolute divine positive names. With us and among creatures, which we discover philosophically in metaphysics, we have a fundamental division of acts into pure or simple acts versus impure or mixed acts, namely an act potency combo, so to speak. And therefore, on the one hand, absolute divine names, which designate our creaturely simple or pure perfections, wise, good, and so on, is a little first, first kind, versus absolute divine names, which designate mixed or impure perfections with us and among creatures, like laughing, reasoning, and so forth. Real divisions of acts and perfections with us and among creatures makes real differences of divine names. Anselm, most famous of all medievals, 
Defined and deployed in theology, this fundamental division of absolute names uh, generated by the fundamental distinction of simple versus mixed perfections and creatures. You can find this in his respective treatments of the so-called ontological argument in both the monologion and prosologion, respectively. Although things become much more complicated, the simple rule is that whenever we have some aspect of pure actuality, it is to be retained of God, whereas whenever we have some aspect of mixed act, again, an act-potency combo, it's to be somewhat removed and somewhat retained. Removed, handling only and whatsoever potency is involved, but retained, handling all and whatsoever act is involved. So we do a little split of the mixture. In fact, this is what we'll discover in future lectures, how we use negative names to target those imperfections. Thomas discusses this for the first time in his career in I Sent D2, where he's concerned particularly with simple perfections, wisdom, goodness, and so on. This concern, in fact, he has throughout his entire life and career. For example, later on in De Potentia Q7, AA 4 through 7, we find Thomas talking about these absolute divine names predicating creaturely simple perfections of God, and he subjects these, these issues to many different questions, such as how do they predicate in Duenas? How do they signify divine essence? This is Article 5 of Q7, De Potentia. How do they predicate substantially, ST1, Q13, A2? And most thorny of all, in fact, one of the central issues that Thomas faces throughout his life is, are these names synonymous and so nugatory or empty of meaning? De Potentia Q7, A6, handling Maimonides. Finally, he'll ask, are these particular names predicated univocally or equivocally? And as you know, perhaps uh, the right answer is analogically, i.e. through analogy of attribution, which Thomas covers, uh, for example, in De Potentia Q7, A7. These names, simple perfections with us among creatures, are Thomas's focus in positive theology because these names designate acts and only acts, and therefore, nothing of their predicate is removed. All of what wisdom is, we put into God. All of what goodness is, we put into God. We don't take anything out. Although negations are involved also in these absolute names, nonetheless, the negations that we do use here don't strike at the essence of the predicate, only the way of having the predicate. Once again, this set of names is what people mean today by the divine attributes or perfections. For example, that God has knowledge, that he has love, and so on. These are all divine attributes, so to speak, because although the mode how God knows and how God loves is not the mode how we know and love, nonetheless, what knowledge and what love each are indeed are found in him. As an aside, this is where analogy of attribution is used and where we speak of participating God's knowledge and love, where we'll speak of knowledge subsistently in God, love subsistently, and many of these kinds of things. This is distinguished from names whose predicates we use, uh, whose essence somehow needs to be removed by negation because it doesn't involve pure but somehow mixed perfection. We divided this category into two based upon whether we needed to remove only part of the predicate or whether we needed to remove all of it. Part of the predicate or all of it. Again, first kind, no removal of the predicate. Second kind, some of the predicate. Third kind, all of the predicate. It's pretty simple. For example, when we say that God reasons, laughs, and names like this, these are mixed perfections. 
Something of reasoning, laughing, and so on is act, but something is potency. It's a mixture. And so when we usurp into duenas, we remove the imperfection and so retain the perfection of God. Remove imperfection, retain perfection. Whereas saying that God is a rock, lion, and so on, we need to remove here the whole predicate and can only affirm these names through analogy of proportionality. A big scary phrase. Um, you'll become very comfortable with this. We'll talk about it quite a lot, I promise you. Rock, lion, and so on. We say these through analogy of proportionality after we've removed the entirety of the predicate. We've zeroed it out, so to speak. God somehow can be compared to a rock, is similar to a lion, and so on, is really what we mean in basic form by these kinds of names. Note that whereas we used analogy of attribution above for wise, good, and so on, we use analogy of proportionality here for rock, lion, etc. And in a future lecture, we'll talk a lot about what analogy of attribution versus proportionality is. It's a thorny issue. Often people become confused, but don't worry. It'll be straightforward enough. Let's dive a bit deeper into each of these categories. First, let's handle those positive names which somehow need negation of their predicate. We divided these into two names such as reasons, laughs, etc., versus those such as rock, lion, and so on. These are our static stock examples that we use so we know what we're talking about. We, we know how to do these names. Um, you're going to hear an awful lot about God is a rock and, and these types of names so that we pinpoint the types of intellectual moves that we make. And then when we come across similar situations in theology, we already know what to do because we've hammered these points home so clearly. Note, first of all, the need for negation. Indeed, whenever we handle positive names at all, we always use negative names, always. Positive and negative names in theology operate like the two tines of a zipper and are always in sync. But in the current case, given what the predicate is as a mixture of potency and act, we need to target the potency with a negation and remove it and leave behind the act and retain it with an affirmation. Hence, we have, so to speak, the two tines of a zipper working together. Notably, these positive names involve the use of the prior negative names that we noted above, incorporeality, impassibility, and so on. In fact, it's these kinds of negative names which we use to target the potencies involved in these sorts of predicates, namely those potencies which are proper to the material order. When we say that God laughs, we note that laughing involves a body which God doesn't have. When we say that he reasons, similarly, we note that this too involves passion or change because reasoning terminates to understanding. Hence, something of both reasoning and laughing needs to be removed, but something thereof can be retained. And this, in fact, the aspect of now purified act or perfection is what is involved in the goodness that is had in reasoning and laughing and others of that sort. In De Veritate Q2A1, Thomas uses here the example of scientia, a certain kind of knowledge, science. Uh, we'll just speak of knowledge here. Uh, in a certain mode, science or scientific knowledge involves imperfection. But in another mode, it involves perfection. It's a mixture. The former needs to be removed in Duenas. God doesn't move from premises to conclusions, whereas the latter needs to be retained in Duenas. God does know things with certainty. As an aside, later neoscholastics will speak of putting the whole predicate, such as reasoning, into Duenas eminently rather than formally. But 
we can speak of that another time. That's just a helpful note for you. On the other hand, although absolute positive names must have their whole predicate removed by these prior negative names, for example, that God is a rock, lion, and so on. In this case, we don't remove and retain. Rather, we zero out the predicate entirely. And the highest kind of affirmative statement that we can use, the highest sort of is we can make in theology in these situations is the is, which happens through analogy of proportionality. Thomas often calls this speaking metaphorically. Rock, lion, etc. are said metaphorically. We often call it as well speaking comparatively because here God is compared to something which formally has the predicate involved. God is a rock means that God is compared to an actual rock in some fashion. God is a lion translates to that he's similar to an actual lion in some way. One very notable set of names here are names involving creaturely passions. Mercy or pity, wrath, and others of that sort. For example, ST1, Q3, A2, ADD2, or even more importantly, SCG1, C91. As it is an aside, these names involve also relative names or rational relations, which are used in the relevant analogies of proportionality. Because of this, these kinds of positive absolute names, rock, lion, etc., don't posit something in God, but merely a certain comparison or rational relation of him to another, as Thomas says in De Veritate Q2. A1 respondeo. However, we might speak of them as implying positing something in God. For example, when we say that God has wrath, the sense is that God, just as an angry man punishes, just so punishes himself, i.e., because he's just. Here, Justice somewhat is implied through the metaphorical name wrath. This is something we'll clarify in heavily precision later, but nonetheless is a good rule of thumb. When we say God is wrath, we mean God just as an angry man punishes, just so God himself punishes. Why? Because he's just, and therefore justice is somewhat implied, we might say, through the metaphorical name wrath. At the opposite end of the food spectrum, though, are those absolute positive names which involve no negation of something in their predicate. You know them? Wise, good, and so on. To reflect this, we often speak of their mode of predication as being properly or formally said. Only considering how the predicates are handles, handled, Saying that God is wise is equivalent to saying that Socrates is wise. Socrates really is wise, and God also really is wise, and nothing of what wisdom is is lacking in either case. Hence, no negation is involved in either. True, in theology, we still do use negation, but it's not negation that targets something of the predicate, but rather that handles the way of having that predicate. Although God is wise and Socrates is wise, nonetheless, they're not wise in the same mode because Socrates derives his wisdom from God's wisdom. Very much is involved here, and we'll have to leave it to one side. We'll cover it in future lectures. But one thing we can say is that here is where we use the posterior negative names we noted from the start, simple, infinite, and so on. This category of negative names adjusts for the various modes of having which are proper to creatures and God, respectively. This is why we often speak of the negative names not as adjectives of God, but as adverbs of us, so to speak. There are instruction manual for what to do in positive theology. And once again, most importantly, 
This kind of absolute name is what people mean by the divine attributes today. They really are a rather small and finite list, which is populated by every creaturely simple perfection. Only these predicates do we simply say that God is or that he has, full stop. God is love, period. No negation is required of the predicate. And just as we saw above with the posterior negative names, which are much harder to deploy, we usually are silent about the need for negation in the case of these names, because the negation only involves the mode of having. While this is obviously important, it's often too difficult for most people. Although, on the other hand, we can easily make some gesture to it by saying that God is love originally, whereas creatures have love derivatively and other kinds of sayings of that sort, which is why scripture often identifies these names with God himself, such as 1 John 4, 8, God is love, period. These divisions of absolute positive names alert us to among the most important contributions of Thomas. It's a thing we'll focus on throughout this course. Namely, positive theology is fundamentally uneven. Positive theology is fundamentally uneven, involving predicates which are more and less similar to God. Indeed, one of my favorite quotations from Thomas, where he's fighting for the very positivity of positive theology itself, is where he says that people often misunderstand theology and don't know that in Duenas, affirmative propositions are more and less. This is, again, De Veritate Q2A1 Respondeo, which I've quoted three or four times in this lecture, so you should read it. It's a great question. This, more and less, though, is important because all of our positive theology is merely analogical and partial, and therefore making these small gains within this kind of analogical knowledge only happens by comparing and contrasting the amount, so to speak, of more and less in various effects of God. Recall that we don't know what God is, only somewhat what God is, just as a cause is known somewhat as what it is from its effects. In the sphere of the effects, however, some are more and some are less revelatory of what the cause is. For example, I perhaps can know somewhat what Socrates is by considering his footprints in the sand. But I can know much more of what he is by considering the sound of his laughter, because laughter is the proper effect of someone having human nature, and therefore most makes known that Socrates, in fact, is a man. Similarly in Duenas, some effects are more, whereas some are less revelatory of what God is. The most revelatory effect is, of course, essay or being, which is the proper or unique effect of God. Hence why Thomas, for example, in ST1 Q13A11, says that the divine name, he who is, is maximally proper or unique to God, i.e., it in a certain mode reveals him best, which is why he took being to himself as his own name in Exodus. 314. Broadly speaking, everyone knows that positive theology is fundamentally uneven because everyone knows that there's a major difference between saying that God is love versus saying that he's a tree. Both these propositions in their own mode are true to say. Indeed, one is said formally because all of what love is, is found in God. Love is a simple perfection with us and among creatures. Whereas another is said comparatively, because although none of what a tree is, is found in God, except eminently, 
Nonetheless, God can be compared to or is similar to a tree because, for example, just as a tree gives life to its branches through the communication of sap, in a similar way, God makes his creatures to be through giving them to be. That's an analogy of proportionality. Both these propositions, God is love and God is a tree, are true to say, but they don't amount to the same. One actually says something about God, whereas another merely makes a comparison of him to another. Saying that God is love is more. Saying that he's a tree is less. Now, everyone knows this with the predicates love and a tree. But in theology and in this course, we do two things. One, we precision the exact amounts of more and less. And two, we determine where each and every positive predicate falls on this scale of more and less. For example, it's easy to see that God is love and God is a tree fall in different divisions of absolute names. You probably recognize immediately and even intuitively that love falls in the top tier of most positivity, simple perfections, whereas tree falls in the bottom tier or the least positivity. However, it perhaps is harder to see that saying that God is love versus that he is angry or has wrath also fall in different divisions of absolute names. As it happens, in fact, saying that God is angry is equivalent in its positivity to saying that he's a tree. Nothing of what anger is can be retained in Dewinas. God has zero anger. But a certain comparison to an angered man can be made because just as a man from his anger punishes, similarly, God from his justice punishes. Same love and wrath in Dewinas is the same amount of more and less as saying love and tree. Both wrath and tree fall in the bottom tier or least positivity. This obviously is quite important to understand and begins to gesture at this fundamental unevenness of positive theology, as well as how that fundamental unevenness really hits the ground and has practical real-life value. My presentation of who God is is vastly different when I accurately communicate in normal person talk that he's most like someone who loves and least like someone who's angry. Both are true, but they don't amount to the same. All right, we can say much more here about absolute positive divine names, but we'll leave this here for a future lecture and turn to our fifth and final division involving relative names. Let's review again and summarize our division so far. Divine names are divided into two, negative, made through division or negative judgment, and positive, made through composition or affirmative judgment. Negative names are divided into two, prior, incorporeal, impassable, and so on. These private imperfections proper to the material order, and also posterior, for example, simple, infinite, etc. These remove from God the imperfections proper to the creaturely order as such, including both material and immaterial orders. Positive names, we divide it into two, absolute, saying something of the subject, and relative, saying something towards another than the subject. Absolute names into two, the names which predicates, which have predicates only having act and perfection, wise, good, and so on. These are the divine attributes. And then those also whose predicates somehow have potency and imperfection, which we, again, divided into two, those needing partial negation, reasoning, laughing, etc., and those needing total negation, rock, lion, and so forth. We're reverting now, then, to relative names and also, surprise, dividing them into two. <laughs>
Those whose truth involves intellectual being, for example, creator, Lord, and so forth. And those whose truth involves real being, father, son, and so on. The latter are the Trinitarian relations, and indeed, only those names involved with the four real Trinitarian relations fall into this latter class, which we add under pressure from supernatural revelation chiefly contained in Holy Scripture. Recall then, for example, that the name Father can fall into both classes of relative names. God is Father of creatures versus God the Father of the Son. First, some general comments here. Relative names are both easy and hard. They're easy in that the very basics are pretty clear fairly quickly. Relative names involve relations. We're speaking here of Aristotle's accidental category, ad aliquid, or towards something. For example, Socrates, the teacher of Plato, Caesar, the ruler of Rome, etc. Note that relations always come in pairs. Plato, the student of Socrates, Rome, the subject of Caesar, etc. Relations are, in fact, and this is very important, simultaneous in nature and in understanding, Aristotle says. Simultaneous both in reality and in reason. When we conceive Plato as the student of Socrates, then ipso facto, that very understanding, we co-understand Socrates as the teacher of Plato. Similarly, in Duenas, when we conceive some creature as subject to God, then ipso facto, that very act of understanding, we co-understand God as the ruler or Lord of the creature. Relations always go in pairs, both in reality and in our reasoning. Also for the Trinitarian relations, when we conceive Christ as the Son of God, then we co-understand God the Father of Christ. Indeed, this is why the entire doctrine of the Trinity, as Thomas says, is said in the name Christ, because when we put the relative name Son into Duenas, then the opposed relation of Father co-arises to meet it, and eventually we derive the entire doctrine of the Holy Trinity. On the other hand, though, relative names also are hard, because really anything more than these very initial comments that I just gave requires quite a lot of philosophical consideration. You can consult Thomas De Potentia QQ7 through 8 for some beginning here. We don't want to handle much here. I usually spend quite a number of lectures in class and live with people on relative names to cover the generals, and we'll spend several lectures on this later. But one point to mention here involves the first class of relative names, such as creator, lord, and so on. These relative names, just as all relative names, have their opposed relative names said of creatures, creature, subject, and so on. However, when we consider each relational pair, their mode of verification is not the same. The creaturely relations of creature and subject involve real being, whereas the corresponding divine relations of creator and Lord in God involve intellectual being. This is a technical point, but because the mode of verification is not altogether the same, we say that creature and subject involve real relations, whereas creator and Lord involve rational relations. This is why we also speak of these relations pairs as mixed relations. Mixed because one is real and the other rational. Here, though, is where people often become confused. People and even many scholars have and continue to misunderstand all of this rather badly 
particularly when we speak of this class of divine relations as rational relations. Recall, the other class of divine relations are real relations, namely the four Trinitarian relations of paternity, filiation, active and passive spiration. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the first class, creator, Lord, and so on. We often call them rational. People imagine, because of this, that when we call them rational relations, that we're merely saying that these relations are just mental fluff and stuff. They then become concerned because saying that these relations aren't real but only rational seems to make God not really connected, not really involved, not really having any actual bearing upon our world. This, however, is not what is intended when we say that these relations are rational. Is this a philosophical description? Which isn't easy to translate into common talk, and for precisely for that reason, is easily miscommunicated and misunderstood. These so-called rational relations are in fact distinct from purely rational relations, which most people are concerned about, and which would amount to merely mental fluff and stuff. Although, regardless, true mental fluff and stuff. For the record, these purely rational relations are involved when we say that God is a rock line and so on. We do have relevance for them in theology. They're just not the so-called rational relations creator Lord that many people quickly become concerned about. What most people intend by saying that God is really involved, really connected, and even really related to us is what we mean by the not-so-purely rational relation which we use here, and philosophically, and also in scholastic theology, we call a rational relation. It's just not the same kind of realness involved in the real opposed relations in the creature, i.e. his creatureliness and subjecthood, and for that reason, we're a bit obnoxious as theologians and say God's relations aren't real, but merely rational. There's much more that can and should be said here, but we'll have to leave this aside. Again, we'll return to it later in a subsequent lecture, but the point is right off the bat that this class of divine relations, which philosophers and theologians call rational, are also exactly what normal people mean by real. All right, let's bring things together as a close and summarize. At the beginning of this lecture, we flagged that one of Thomas's triumphs was that he made theology universal and adequate. The reason for this is that he adequately reduced everything of creatures down to their fundamental components of potency and act, which generates the division between negative and positive divine names. Thomas then reduced everything of creaturely potencies down to their adequate categories handling imperfections proper to material being as such, and also creaturely being as such, privating each and all of these, says everything of God which can be said from removing potency from him, and it also generates the first division of negative names into prior, namely incorporeal and passable, and posterior, simple, infinite, and so on. We also saw the need to divide positive names into absolute, saying something of God himself, versus relative, saying something of God in relation to creatures. With help from particular Anselm, who determined the nature of simple and mixed perfections philosophically, Thomas handled everything of creatures' acts by reducing them down again to their adequate categories. We have acts which are pure and acts which are mixed. Other divisions are involved, some of which we didn't mention, but this generates the divisions of absolute names into those which don't involve negation of the predicate, wise, good, and so on, and those which somehow do, reasoning, laughing on the one hand, and lion, rock on the other. We further flag that positive names falling into these various divisions amount to more or less positive theology fundamentally is uneven. And in fact, scholastic theology is about equipping us to say that unevenness carefully of God. God is more like love, less like a tree. And yes, more like love, less like wrath. 
When speaking positively of God from his effects, we prioritize his fundamental unevenness in his effects so that our overall positive theology as a whole is most similar to what God is while still also being chastened by the ever greater difference because in whatsoever similarity an ever greater dissimilarity is found later in four or Thomas Aquinas SCG 1 C 29 God attributes all perfections to realities and because of this with all realities he has both similitude and dissimilitude at the same time we finally concluded very briefly, a reflection on relative names, which were divided into two, rational relations, creator, Lord, and so on, and then the real Trinitarian relations, father, son, etc. All right, that's enough for this lecture. We'll carry on further next time. God be with you.